So we're going to talk about it briefly, but I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it. You have to know that the mean is the average of the numbers. And so you just add all of the numbers together. There's a data set there. 3 plus 5 plus 5 plus 6 plus 8 plus 10 plus 12. That equals 49. And so then to get the average there, we just divide by the number of data points we have, which is 7. So 49 divided by 7 is 7. The median then is just the middle number in the sequence. So if we're using that same data set there, the 3, the 5, the 5, the 6, the 8, the 10, and the 12, we just have to count and figure out what the middle represented number is. So if there's seven numbers there. That means the fourth number is the middle. And so that would be six. Mode, on the other hand, sometimes is tricky because it could have one mode in a data set. But the mode is just the most commonly occurring of the numbers. And so if we look at that data set again, there's two fives. So that means five is our mode. So basic kind of math stuff. I'm not going to spend a ton of time here. But what you do have to understand is why or when we would choose to use one of those statistics versus the other. That's kind of the tricky part here when we're talking about statistics. So how do I decide whether I want to use the median, the mode, or the mean in talking about or summarizing my data in psychology? So which measure of central tendency is best? And it really kind of depends what you're doing. You have to think critically here about the information. I think most commonly when we see a study referenced or even like a commercial on TV, they'll talk about the average this or the mean of this. And so that's probably the most commonly used um, descriptor for statistics, but it can sometimes be really deceptive. Um, looking at this image that I have here, each of those little green people represents a family. And so if I asked, let's say that this is my AP psychology class, and I asked all of the kids what their annual family income was. See that a couple families make $15,000 a year, a good amount of families make $20,000, and then we have one family way up on the right side that's making $710,000 a year. If I took all of those numbers, added them all up, 15 plus 15 plus 20 plus 20 plus all the 25s, all the 30s, and I actually calculated the average, the mean is actually about $70,000. But if I look at this data and I have all my data points plotted, $70,000 is not really an accurate description of the average income of my students' families, right? Because only three families are making more than $70,000 in my AP psychology class. The rest, the vast majority, are making a lot less than that. So the problem with using the mean is that it can really be skewed by outliers, and you have to know that. You have to understand that. So when you see a study referenced or you see a commercial on TV talking about the average or talking about the mean and it doesn't seem quite right, Think about how just one person over here, this $710,000 person, is skewing everybody's data upwards, and it's not giving us an accurate depiction of what the actual mean or the actual average is. So if we're concerned with the mean being skewed, we would instead look to using something like the median because it mitigates the outlying data. The median, which is 30,000, you can see represented in that image, is a much better um, example of what our average class income is. The mode would for this one be 20,000. Typically, I mean, you don't see the mode being used a whole lot. You still need to know what it is, but it's usually the mean or the median are going to be the two most common forms of describing and summarizing the data that we have at hand. So file that into your brain. You have to know the mean can be skewed, and so sometimes we want to use the median instead when we have really far outlying data. So I have a data set here with just some numbers listed. The first thing that we can use to measure the variation in a data set is the range. And so the range is really just a crude measure. I take the highest number. So in this data set, the highest number is 77 and the lowest score, which is 62. And I just subtract 77 minus 62. So the range of my data is 15. That doesn't really tell me a whole lot because there could be a lot more numbers in between there or there could be very few numbers in between there. So the range is a crude measure. We could use it, 
but there's other methods that give us much better description because again we're using descriptive statistics so we want to describe our data and really understand it um, so there's better measures of descriptive statistics um, and so we're getting into something kind of complicated and i want before you even start freaking out about all of what it says under variance you do not need to know the full out calculation for variance I just listed it there so that you understand how that number comes about, but they will never ask you on an AP test to calculate it out. So you don't have to like worry to measure this super obscure format. If you are interested in calculating variance and standard deviation, I did throw a worksheet up on the AP Psychology Student Facebook page. Again, you don't have to know how to do it, but sometimes it just helps to see where the numbers come from to really understand and to really get it. So it's there if you want it, but if you feel overwhelmed by it, don't worry about it. So for variance, we're actually measuring how much each score um, varies from the mean in a data set. And so you calculate by taking the standard DV, or you calculate the mean, you square the differences, you divide the sum, and that gives you the number. So you really need to know is that variance is how far each number in the set is from the mean or varies from the mean. And then from variance, we can calculate our next number. And you do need to know standard deviation. Again, not the full calculation, but you need to know what it is. It's pretty important. Standard deviation tells us how much each score also varies from the mean, and it's the square root of variance. That is the key. That might be a question on an AP test. So variant standard deviation is the square root of variance. So if there was a question on the AP test, I'm going to throw this at you. If variance equals 100, what is the standard deviation of the data? There's not too many people in here, but someone want to take a shot at that. If variance is 100, what is the standard deviation of the given data? And I'll leave that for a second and actually flip back. So remember, standard deviation is the square root of variance. So in that question, oh, my screen is frozen. There we go. In that question, yep, so it is the square root of 100. So that would be 10. Um, it could go the opposite way, too. It could give you standard deviation is 5 and then ask you what's the variance. And then so you would just square it. So 5 squared is 25 would be the variance. We like to see small numbers here because that means then that our data is closer to the mean, and then we know that the mean is a good representation. So this kind of links back to what we talked about with central tendency. If our standard deviation is a small number, that means most of the scores then are situated around the mean, which means, mean, mean, sorry, which means that the average is a good statistical measure of the group. So in our data, um, a lot of times it forms what we would call a normal curve. So the mean on a normal curve is this middle, the middle bar that's at the peak of the curve. And Rosemary is correct. IQ always forms a normal curve. So we'll use that as our example. If IQ is 100 um, for the, the mean, that goes in the middle there. And so that means 50% of the population, population is going to fall about under that and 50% is going to fall above. And what you need to memorize here are the percentages. So that 34.13 on either side of the mean, those are standard deviations. So that minus one, where it says next to the mean test score, that minus one is one deviation from the mean. And that plus one is also one standard deviation from the mean. So if we say that our mean is 100, and let's go back to the last question that we did, standard deviation was 10. That means one standard deviation from the mean is going to be 90 to 100, and then 100 to 110. We go both sides of the mean, if that makes sense. And then if we're moving two standard deviations out past that where it says 13%, we would take another 10. So then we would have 80 to 100, that's two standard deviations, and 100 to 120. So that, um, those are the percentages of people that would fall within that percentage range. So sometimes on the test, I've seen the question, 
how many people fall within one standard deviation of the mean? Well, there's a 34% below and 34% above, so you'd need to know about 68% of the population falls within one standard deviation of the mean. I've also seen them ask two standard deviations, which is about 96%. So I would um, honestly just get one of these graphs. You can just literally Google normal curve and I would just mark it up at home. I would write down, maybe take like IQ or some other common factor and just label it out what that means, minus one standard deviation, plus one standard deviation, what that kind of means for like realistically with numbers, what that represents. I wouldn't worry about percentile ranks a whole lot. I don't think that that is something that would pop up on the AP test. It's mostly just the standard deviation piece and understanding what that means on the curve.